Good morning, Walnut Village. Well, today, May 11th, we finish up our study of the book of Joshua as we are in the last chapter, Joshua 24. It's been a good book and a good study, and I hope that you have enjoyed it and learned uh, from studying it as much as I have. Well, we left off, of course, with chapter 23 last week, and let's just review uh, before we finish up with chapter 24 this morning. In 23, we saw that Joshua, in his old age, gathered the leadership of Israel together to give them a farewell address, to communicate to them the things of his heart, the things that meant the most to him, the things that were important for the children of Israel to remember, to not forget in their following of God. Joshua begins his address by giving glory to God. And this is good coaching for all of us. Whenever we pray, perhaps it would be good for us to start by giving glory to God, thanking him for all that he does and who he is. And, you know, it would have been easy for Joshua to just focus on what he had done as a military leader, especially because Joshua had an impressive record. But he is far more interested in glorifying God than talking about himself. And that is the proper perspective in which uh, Joshua held himself because we know that it was God himself that brought the victories. Yes, he used Joshua. Yes, Joshua was faithful and had a very impressive record, but God was the reason. And without God, Joshua's record would have fallen. So Joshua then reminded those gathered that it remains for each individual tribe to fully possess what God has given him. It's like I say on Sunday mornings, you know, a gift is no good if you don't open it. And so here too, uh, with the children of Israel, in the same way, they had to fully possess the land. And in the same way God gives every believer an inheritance, we need to remember that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing through Christ. And we read that in Ephesians 1.3. You may want to look that up later today. God has a definite part for us to play in possessing our inheritance. So we see that uh, Israel going forward could really only succeed if they were obedient to God, and that took courage. So what do I mean by that? Well, following God in his word isn't something for the faint of heart, because sometimes in following God, we have to make hard choices. Our human nature, our sinful human nature, in that nature, we tend to focus on the aspects of obedience that we like, the ones that we support, the ones that maybe are easy for us, and we skip over the parts that attract us less or are difficult to follow or are weaknesses in our character. Well, Satan doesn't care which extremes takes us in the wrong direction. Either our legalism or our licentiousness can cause us to fall, and it pleases Satan when it distracts from God. Israel's enemies, we saw, had witnessed the great power of Israel's God. So it was a reminder to Israel and to us that Israel did not necessarily worry the enemies of God, but Israel's God terrified them. So they were frightened of Israel for that reason. Sometimes we forget that it is God that produces uh, tremendous good in our lives. And people's reaction to us is more a reaction to who our God is. And then Joshua tells Israel in his address to not even make mention of these false gods of the Canaanites. Have you ever heard someone talk a lot about Satan, about the devil did this or Satan did that? Or they have this interest in things about Satan that's giving too much credit to Satan. Satan has been defeated. He is not powerful. He is nothing uh, that we should focus on or pay attention to in a sense, but put our focus on God. And so Joshua says, instead of learning about your enemies, the Canaanites, instead, the quote is, hold fast to the Lord, their God. That's what Joshua instructs Israel to do. How often we see that the temptation that we have pampered and encouraged and indulged in our own lives has become a scourge and a thorn in our side. The compromising Christian is not a happy man. Ungodly influences never advertise themselves as an instrument of ruin. Instead, they present themselves as wonderful things. But we must see past all of this. That's the nature of a temptation. 
It looks so good. We can't resist it, but it leads to ruin. Well, the chapter then ends with a reminder of the principle of blessing for obedience and curses for disobedience. And that was a specific part of Israel's covenant with God. And you'll read in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 that covenant. And Joshua emphasized that God will be just as faithful to judge as he has been to bless. And with obedience comes blessings unlimited. That's the message that Joshua leaves with the children of Israel in chapter 23. Okay, our passage today, Joshua 24, let's get right into it. This is all about the Lord's covenant with Israel that is renewed. So we read, starting with verse 1, Then Joshua summoned all the tribes of Israel to Shechem. And um, this was really a, a dramatic thing. Uh, it was a dramatic last gathering of Israel before the passing of Joshua. And it may or may not have been part of the farewell that we read about in Joshua 23. We don't have the sense of that. No specific place of gathering is mentioned in Joshua 23, so it could have been part of this same meeting at Shechem uh, that Joshua calls the people to. Now Shechem is an ancient city that was situated on the floor of a valley near the entrance to Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, and it formed uh, respective walls on either side of the valley. So the contour of the land resulted in a natural amphitheater, uh, and the acoustics of which were so good that the human voice carried to exceptional distances. That's a little piece of, of education that uh, Arthur Pink gives us. So Joshua calls all the people together, including their elders, leaders, judges, and officers. So they came and presented themselves to God. And again, these are all the representatives of all the children of Israel. Uh, Joshua could not address the whole nation as one. It would be too, bar too large, probably fill that valley. So the people presented themselves to God for the making or renewal of the covenant that he had made with Israel. Verse 2, Joshua said to the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Uh, long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, and they worshipped other gods. But I took your ancestor Abram from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him into the land of Canaan. I gave him many descendants through his son Isaac. So there's a couple points that we need to make here. One, thus says the Lord God of Israel. That is a dramatic statement. And we don't often think of Joshua as a prophet, but here he spoke as an inspired messenger of God. Prophecy is not necessarily a prediction of the future. Sometimes it is just a straightforward statement of the truth, and it can be uniquely direct and spontaneous word from God. The other point to make is before God challenged Israel, uh, he reminded them of his faithfulness. So through, through Joshua, uh, God is reminding Israel, all of Israel, of his history with them. His goodness was shown at the very beginning of his dealings with Abraham and Abraham's descendants. All right, verse 4. To Isaac, this is Joshua speaking for God, reminding them of this good history. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau, I gave the mountains of Zer, while Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, this is uh, God again, and I brought terrible plagues on Egypt, and afterward I brought you out as free people. But when your ancestors arrived at the Red Sea, the Egyptians chased after you with chariots and charioteers. When your ancestors cried out to the Lord, I put darkness between you and the Egyptians. I brought the sea crashing down on the Egyptians, drowning them. With your very own eyes, you saw what I did. Then you lived in the wilderness for many years. Well, there were still many among the leaders uh, and the elders of Israel who had been children when Israel came out of Egypt. And so they had seen what God could do, his tremendous power. And they witnessed his destruction of the Egyptian army at the Red Sea. And these were the ones that Joshua was giving reminders to, giving them reminders of just what they had experienced, even if it was as uh, they were children. 
Then that phrase, then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. That must have been a heavy burden for many of them that wandered for 40 years. Through Joshua, the Lord is summarized most of the Exodus journey with just that one sentence. Then you dwelt in the wilderness for a long time. Notably missing here, and this is a great point, because it speaks to God's grace. Notably missing from the review of Israel's history is any mention of Israel's sin and rebellion and failure, though that was why they were kept wandering in the wilderness for all those years. Though God recorded those things at their time, as we read in Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, when he actually reviewed their history through Joshua with the elders and the leaders of Israel, he made no mention of this sin, which is a curious thing. Later, God said, their sin I will remember no more. We read that from the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 31, verse 34. So here is God extending grace and acting as if he had completely forgotten about Israel's past sin. This is the way God operates. When he forgives, he says the sin no longer exists. It's no longer held against you. All right, verse 8. Finally, I brought you into the land of the Amorites in the east side of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I destroyed them before you. I gave you victory over them, and you took possession of their land. Then Balak, a son of Zippor, king of Moab, started a war against Israel. He summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to him. Instead, I made Balaam bless you, and so I re rescued you from Balak. So this is that story where there was an earthly prophet that was supposed to curse, and God changed the heart of that person so that they pronounced a blessing and really foiled uh, Balak, the Moab king that sent, them, uh, sent him to curse Israel. Verse 11, when you crossed the Jordan River and came to Jericho, the men of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. But I gave you victory over them, and I sent terror ahead of you to drive out the two kings of the Amorites. It was not your swords or bows that brought you victory. I gave you land you had not worked on, and I gave you towns you did not build, the towns where you are now living. I gave you vineyards and olive groves for food, though you did not plant them. These are real gifts. Had the Israels done all this work, they might have looked at this as not a gift. They might have taken it with, for granted. But through Joshua, God again reminds them, not with your sword or bow, not with any effort. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, vineyards and olive groves which you did not plant. So there is a sense in which every blessing we experience is undeserved. But some are more obvious uh, than others. When Israel enjoyed the vineyards, when they, they had that fruit, when they had the great harvest, when they saw how rich the soil was in the land, it made it especially uh, made them especially grateful for undeserved blessings. They, it, it was visual reminders. It was very tactile. Uh, they should also have remembered that those who planted the vineyards and orchards were removed by God's righteous judgment. And so if Israel disobeyed and rejected God, they might also be judged or removed as well. So you, you have this tremendous blessing that is very obvious in the fruit of their labor uh, in fields that God gave them, but then you have that cautionary tale. What was the history of these people that abandoned these vineyards, abandoned these lands, were driven out? They rejected God and they were removed from the land. So the cautionary tale is that this could befall Israel if they strayed away from their faith and belief and following of God. Verse 14, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Again, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth is what the NIV says. This is a wonderful ending. This was not a blind leap of faith. Uh, the children of Israel saw God's work and experienced his blessing, so it made sense for them to ex exclusively serve a God who had done so much for them. 
However, here's something that Alan Redpath tells us, which is good. Remember that the real test of our faithfulness to God is in most cases, it's our power to continue steadfastly in one course of conduct when the excitement of conflict is removed and the enemies with which we have contended are the insidious allurements of ease or custom amid the commonplace duties of life. So what's Red Path saying here? He's saying that when we face tremendous trials and we're all amped up in fear, concern, and worry, and we plead with God, and God gives us victory in those moments, that's almost easier than what happens when we just have peace and blessings and commonplace life. It's in that period of time that we're perhaps in jeopardy of taking it all for granted and not following God as we do in times of crisis. So Joshua again says, now, so fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idol, idols your ancestors worshiped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. So if you recall, Abram wasn't Jewish, and God called him out of a foreign land where there was foreign gods. And so here Joshua is reminding the people of this and saying there was a choice of who Abram served. You have a choice of who you will serve. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, Joshua tells them, uh, you need to choose today whom you will serve. So they had to make a choice. Everyone serves some kind of a God or our God. Now, it's really interesting. This is real obvious, even to people that don't follow God. Some of you may remember, may uh, be familiar with some of the songs of the poet, songwriter, rock guy, Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan has a famous song that says, you got to choose somebody. Everybody chooses something. Even, even a secular Bob Dylan understood this. So the Israelites were called into making a choice. Everyone serves some kind of God or God. Our choice for God is made clear in the mind of having alternatives. Some feel a life lived for God is a bad choice, but what do they have to compare it to? The other choices, really, if they do the comparison, are far worse. Peter, the Apostle Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He says this in John 6, 68. So Peter is recognizing that when you look at the alternatives, there is no other choice but to follow God. That's where the good lies. Well, Joshua then continues on. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, the pagan gods? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me, Joshua says, and my family, we will serve the Lord. So it's neither of those bad choices, it is serving God. That's what Joshua says he will do and sets the example. And this was, as I listed for you here, a choice set before Joshua, and he chose correctly his whole entire life. Joshua could make this statement because he had lived a life that continuously chose to serve the Lord. Oh, that each of us at the end of our lives would be able to look back and say, we made choices for the most part to serve the Lord. And here I've listed them, as I said, Joshua chose to fight against the Amalekites, choosing when it might cost him everything. Joshua chose to reject the golden calf, choosing when the flesh might be satisfied. Joshua chose to serve the Lord by serving Moses rather than choosing a humble place. Joshua chose to believe God's promise about the promised land rather than choosing against the majority. Josh, rather choosing against the majority, I should say. Joshua chose to recognize the leadership of the captain of the Lord's army, choosing to surrender to God. Joshua chose to take leadership of Israel and lead them into the land, choosing faith instead of unbelief. Verse 16, so the people replied, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes 
As we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for he alone is our God. So the history that Joshua gave them and reminded them of is the history that they believed in and which formed their experience with God and caused them to make the statement that they would also choose not the heathen gods, but to serve the Lord alone. And as they say, for he alone is our God. So here then we see the covenant with God is renewed. Joshua says, here's what God did, here's what God promises, here's what I and my family will do and who we will serve, and you have a choice to make, and the Israelites made the right choice. But then Joshua in verse 19 goes on, he says, then Joshua warned the people, this isn't an idle choice that you make. This isn't just an easy, okay, sure, we're going to follow God today, maybe abandon him in the future or see what else happens. Joshua recognizes human nature and the history of Israel, why they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So verse 19, then Joshua warned the people, you are not able to serve the Lord for he is holy and a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, he will turn against you and destroy you, even though he has been so good to you. So Joshua is telling him this is no easy thing. He cautions against a lightly made commitment. Joshua is not trying to discourage their faith. He's not saying, oh, you can't serve God, don't even try. No, he's trying to discourage a light commitment to following the Lord. He wants them to think about what they're committing to. They need to be reminded that they are serving a God under a covenant that promised they would be cursed for disobedience. Jesus expressed the same kind of warning, explaining that following him took total commitment. And you can read that in Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. It wasn't that Jesus didn't want followers, wasn't calling people to follow him. No, that wasn't it. He, what he was doing, just like Joshua, he did not want them to lightly make a commitment that could easily be broken. He wanted them to make a life commitment that they would adhere to and hold to. Verse 21, but the people answered Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Verse 22, Joshua then says, You are a witness to your own decision. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied, we are witnesses to what we have said. Joshua then goes on, All right then, destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Here's where Clark gives some uh, great wisdom uh, in, in interpretation of what Joshua is instructing them. The people make a commitment, so Joshua immediately challenges them to keep their commitment with actions. And as Clark says then, as you have promised to reform, begin instantly the work of reformation. A man's promise to serve God soon loses its moral hold if his conscience, if in his conscience he does not instantaneously begin to put it in practice. The grace that enables him to promise is that by which the strength he is to begin the performance. So Clark is saying you, the commitment wanes in importance if you don't immediately put it into practice. From that moment that you make that decision, make that commitment, you can't just say, I'll get to it later this week, because later this week turns into later this month, later this year, later this lifetime. All right, verse 24. The people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God. We will obey him alone. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shechem, committing them to follow the decrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded these in the book of God's instructions. And as a reminder of their agreement, he took a huge stone and rolled it beneath the terebinth tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord. Joshua said to all the people, this stone has heard everything the Lord said to us. It will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word to God. I want to stop here. I think that is really an interesting statement and an interesting action. Here is a stone that will testify to this 
commitment the children of Israel made. It's almost as though the stone has a voice. And we know that God is the creator of this world and all the material things in it, including stones. It's very much like what we read in the Old Testament, that if the people do not uh, testify to God, the very stones will cry out in praise. All right, verse 27. Joshua said to the people, this stone has heard everything the Lord said to us. It will be a witness to testify against you if you go back on your word to God. Then Joshua sent all the people away to their homelands, the various parts of Israel and the promised land in which they had been given uh, by Moses and Joshua. All right, then we finish the chapter. It's a fitting end. The leaders are buried in the promised land. Verse 29. After this, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land he had been allocated at Timnasserah in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. The people of Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua. And again, just a reminder, what a wonderful legacy. Don't you want your children and grandchildren or your friends or those that remember you to describe you as a person who served the Lord throughout your lifetime? The, okay, the people of Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him, those who had personally experienced all that the Lord had done for Israel. Israel served the Lord all the days of their lives, all the days of Joshua. This was the greatest legacy of Joshua. Not his battles, not his wisdom, not his prophecies, not his leadership. It was that he served God his entire life. Verse 32, the bones of Joshua, which the Israelites had brought along with them when they left Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the plot of land Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor for a hundred pieces of silver. This land was located in the territory allotted to the descendants of Joseph. Eleazar, son of Aaron, also died. He was buried in the hill country of Ephraim in the town of Gibeah, which had been given to his son Phinehas. So this may seem like an inconsequential point, but it fulfills Genesis 50, 25. God likes to tie up loose ends. This is also mentioned in Hebrews 11:22 as an example of Joseph's faith. So, so God never leaves things hanging. He finishes stories, he finishes our stories, he finishes commitments, he finishes his plans and his buildings as well. All right, something to consider for this week. I've given you just a couple things. Serve the Lord. We read that, right? In the review of his, Israel's history, we might say that God contrasted his great work with three sets of gods, little g, gods, associated with three waters. What is it? Well, Joshua 24, 2 and 4 shows that the other side of the Euphrates were the gods of Sumerian and Babylonian culture, or gods of heritage. Joshua 24, 5 through 7 shows on the other side of the Red Sea were the gods of ancient Egypt, gods of upbringing. And then Joshua 24, 7b and 13 and 24, 15 shows that they, as they crossed the Jordan, there were gods of the Amorites, gods of culture. So Joshua applied the principle, the Lord God of Israel is greater than all these idols, therefore serve the Lord. So it doesn't matter for the Israelites what the cultures around them were, what their heritage was, what their upbringing was, what their history in the culture was, none of that mattered. It was serve the Lord. And you know, for us, maybe the lesson is to take some stock of our lives and say, what are the gods that we have to set aside and resist serving in our lives today? Finally then, our prayer for this week. Pray the Lord's Prayer each day, considering what each phrase means. Holy is your name. Your will be done. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin. Keep us from failing when tempted. Deliver us from evil. Yours, God, is the glory and the power forever. Amen.